I hope God exists. A personal God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good. But what then do I do with evil? Moral evil, the sufferings we cruelly inflict on one another. Natural evil, the miseries a heartless world visits on us. All manner of unspeakable horrors. If I seek God, I cannot avoid evil. Can the enormity of evil ever be compatible with the existence of God? I hear the arguments of philosophers and theologians. But God, to be creator, would have to be mighty clever. So why couldn't God have created the world without such evil? If our world is really God's world, is evil necessary? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. I begin with a vigorous atheist who was once a believer. Walter Sinnott Armstrong, professor of ethics at Duke. Why does Walter love talking about evil? Walter, anybody who would like to believe in God, as I would, has to confront the problem of evil, as a theist might put it, or the argument from evil, as an atheist might put it. What are the kinds of arguments that we have to deal with? There really are different versions of the problem of evil or the argument from evil, and it's important to keep them distinct. One version is the logical version, and it actually tries to show that theology or theism is internally inconsistent, so it's not logically possible that there would be a God if evil exists. Because God is theoretically all-powerful and all-good, and you can't combine those together in a logical argument. Yeah, exactly. That's the argument. But I think most people have given up on the logical problem of evil. They don't claim that it's a logical inconsistency among those different views. Uh, instead, the claim is that evil and the amount of evil and the variety of kinds of evil and the intensity of that evil provides an awful lot of evidence against there being a God that's all powerful and all good. So that's called the evidential argument uh, okay, from so, evil so against the existence of God. Okay, now people talk about two different kinds of evil a moral evil and a natural evil. Well, moral evil is normally seen as evil that occurs as a result of human acts of free will. There are lots of suffering in the world is caused by human actions, rapes and murders and thefts. All kinds of crimes fall under causes of moral evil. One possible response is free will. People say, well, free will is a very valuable thing. God maybe allows free will in the world because free will is so valuable, even if some people will abuse that free will and cause harms to other people. The argument would go even further than that. They would say that it would be impossible for God to create any world in which there were uh, uh, no possibility for evil if God wanted to have free will and God had no choice in the matter. Because right. in order to have free will, you must allow evil to be able to develop. I don't think that argument works uh, because I think that it's, it's perfectly within an omnipotent being's capabilities to prevent the evil in the world uh, while still allowing people to have free will. Uh, one example would be, say, someone who goes onto the internet and tries to lure young children into places where uh, this predator can rape them or kill them. Well, God can just make that person's computer crash. And then he has free will but not the ability to cause the evil. And so not freedom of action, but still freedom of will. So you're now having God to be a tinkerer with the world, and God has to tinker here and tinker there and just be constantly doing lots of things. But maybe that's not the way the world is structured. Well, maybe not, but a lot of theologians think God is a tinkerer, answering prayers here and there and performing miracles here and there. God is a tinkerer is nothing that I created. <laughs> All right, but let, let's go back to where you're feeling most comfortable right. and if to present your argument right. from evil against the existence of God, which seems to be 
the evidential argument using natural evil in right. the world. And I like to focus on natural evil because it avoids all those questions about free will. And it doesn't seem to me that you need moral evil because there's so much natural evil in the world. You know, when an earthquake creates a tsunami and kills hundreds of thousands of people and leaves even more homeless, or when a birth defect occurs and a young child lives a short while in intense suffering, then it seems to me you've got a type of evil which doesn't result from human acts of free will. It's natural evil. And the question is, why would God allow that? If God cares about the child, why would God let that happen. I can't see any good reason to pick the total universe where the child suffers instead of the total universe where the child doesn't suffer. And that's exactly the problem of evil. Theus indeed have a problem of evil and Walter enjoys pushing it in their face. He wisely focuses on natural evil because if no human being causes the evil, free will cannot come to God's defense. I yearn to believe in God, but the problem of evil is like a stake in my heart. Can theists preserve their God? The burdens on believers, I declare, to explain evil. That's why I go to Oxford, to put the problem to a leading Christian philosopher, Richard Swinburne. Richard, how do you begin to attack the problem of evil if you want to show that an all-good, all-powerful God exists, and yet realizing the amount of evil in the world? You have to explain why he would allow it to occur. If God is to give us the great good of choosing between good and evil, he cannot at the same time ensure that we bring about the good. So uh, it's a necessary condition of him giving, <laughs> uh, giving us this freedom that he allows evil to occur. It's a good thing to have free will, but uh, mere having a choice uh, isn't such a good as having an effective choice. That is to say, it's good not merely that we shall have a choice, but our choices shall make a difference to things. In other words, that we should be responsible for ourselves and each other in the world. Now, God could, of course, have limited that responsibility to ensuring that we could choose alternate good things to do for other people, that we couldn't do any harm. But in that case, he would have totally pre-programmed things. He wouldn't have trusted us. So if we are to have real responsibility for ourselves and each other, we must have the responsibility of doing the wrong thing as well as doing the right thing. And I'd just like to make a connected point. Any good action we do makes it easier to do a good action of that kind next time. Any bad action we do makes it easier to do a bad action of that kind next time. So what God gives us is the choice of beginning to make our own character. This is a further good made possible by the good of free choice. You've talked about this problem of evil as being a subject which has perhaps tormented you over your career and you have actually changed in your thinking over the years. I certainly realized it's more complicated than I used to think. For example, I just thought, well, if it's uh, logically necessary for a greater good, then that is enough to justify the evil. But uh, I hadn't appreciated that for God to have the right to allow this to occur, he must provide a life which is on balance better, such that it's better the person had lived it. But it becomes a lot more complicated than that in various ways. You can often show that a certain sort of evil is necessary for a certain sort of good unless uh, God produces another sort of good. But if he produces another sort of good, that will necessarily make possible another sort of evil which couldn't be compensated for by a greater good. That's to say there is an enormous number of channels and uh, one small illustration of that might be, well, look, why doesn't God make a world in which we think we have 
responsibility because when we kick people, they scream out. So it looks as we have real choices before us. But in fact, people uh, never really feel pain when, when you kick them. Why doesn't God make a world in that way deceptive? We would have just the same amount of, as it were, agonizing choice in that world. Uh, but then the answer to that is that would be deceptive of God and God must not be a deceiver. Do you feel that in order to have the good overwhelm the evil as a total, you need an afterlife? Even when we've taken all the good of being of use and so on into account, there are some people for whom life on earth is such as it is better that they had not lived than they have. Then for that purpose, for them, and for them only, there is necessary an afterlife, a special sort of afterlife, a compensatory afterlife. The normal sort of life, the afterlife that religions deal in is, a, is a, a, not a compensatory afterlife, it's a reward or punishment or just a good thing in itself for people to have. Richard argues that evil enables the greater good of free will and character development. That's the classic theistic explanation, or excuse. It is coherent, it does make sense within the systematic theology of biblical religion. But I've heard it so often, it can start to sound stale. There's so much agony and anguish it's the enormity of evil that shakes one's faith. Yet, if I'd believe in God and I'd want to, I wouldn't want a fairy tale world where God always intervenes to make mean things nice. So if the biblical God is real, evil is certainly real, there would have to be more to this story. I ask a young Christian philosopher who dares to innovate in traditional religion, Robin Collins. Theists have typically divided the answers to two types, what they call a defense and what they call a theodicy. A defense simply tries to say, despite the evil in the world and the, the horrendous quality of it, it doesn't offer good reasons to discount the existence of God. And the typical thing a defender says is that um, we, just because we can't find an explanation for these evil doesn't mean there isn't one. We wouldn't expect to be able to find all the explanations. Because, because God is God's so far above so us. So far above us, such an infinite being, he's bound to have reasons for allowing evil that we couldn't even probe. On the other it sounds like a retreat or a defeatist attitude. It sounds attitude. like a retreat, but I think from a formal level it isn't. But I think it would be a retreat if you couldn't find any explanations that worked at all. So what I think is some explanations do work. There is what they call theodicies, which are reasons humans have tried to discern for why God allows evil. And my big picture on that is some of the, each of the theodicies, you could think of a big circle and all the evils in the world are in the circle. Like the free will theodicy explains this section of the circle, maybe the soul building theodicy explains some of these evils, and what a uh, new theodicy I've come up with, which I call the connection building theodicy, might explain others. But I see a value in us connecting with each other, helping each other out. So let's suppose you're suffering terribly. And I'm there sharing in your suffering, helping you during that time of suffering. Then there's a valuable connection formed between us and assuming as theists do that we're gonna live forever, that connection's always going to be there. It's always going to be the case that I was there when you were suffering. The value of this connection, if it's at all intrinsically valuable, its value keeps accumulating forever and I would say its value outweighs the value of that evil. Your point is that with all the different kinds of evil, you really need a series of different theodicies or explanations right. to deal with certain sectors. Because right. 
there's no one explanation that can cover them all. Right, and you wouldn't expect that. I mean, when I do things, usually I have multiple reasons for doing that, and I'm only a human being of limited mind. How much more would we expect of God who would have a manifold set of reasons for doing whatever God is doing, creating this universe, for instance? Human connections forged in the crucible of enduring evil. I guess this can work. But Robin, still I hang my head. The world's evil seems too vast, too terrible. I do agree that if God and evil can ever be reconciled, if, there would have to be multiple reasons. What about the traditional theological reproach? The harsh condemnation that the cause of evil is sin. I hear this in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. I go to Yeshiva University to ask Rabbi David Schatz, a believer, how he sees the necessity of evil. David, I've spoken to many Christian philosophers who deal with the Odyssey trying to explain evil. Now, my mother would be very <laughs> upset if I didn't talk to a Jewish philosopher right. about the same right. problem. Right. I mean, I have to say, some of the solutions that have been offered to the problem of evil lead you to ask the question, how could a good God allow these solutions <laughs> to, be, to be given? Because they're not very compelling. There is a kind of uh, misconception, perhaps, that Judaism maintains that everything that happens to a person is happening as reward or punishment. Uh, that, that there is no uh, suffering without transgression, no death without sin. And when this is raised in the Talmud by a particular sage, when he puts forward that thesis, the Babylonian Talmud rejects his view. And I think it's also rejected in a biblical work, the book of Job. Here you have Job is suffering terribly. And his friends talk to him as to why he might be suffering. And, you know, with friends like that, <laughs> you don't need enemies. They tell him, God is just. If you are suffering, it's got to be because you did something wrong. They affirm God's justice through and through. Eov, meantime, Job, is on the verge of blaspheming God. Then a crazy thing happens. You come to the last chapter of Job, chapter 42, and God says to the friends, I am angry at you because you did not speak about me properly the way my servant Job did, and therefore Job's gonna have to pray for you. This is amazing, because here they were affirming God's justice all the way through the book. Job is the one who was on the verge of cursing him. So I think the explanation is that God is sort of saying, if you think that my standards are such that I would regard Job as an evil person, then there's something wrong with your conception of me. It's an insult to me to think that I work that way. So I think Job itself is a rejection of the retributivist theodicy. And I would argue that what you really have here is a, a kind of question about the effects that suffering will have on a person. Can suffering bring about something better in a person? And this is the bet between God and Satan at chapter two, where they debate what will happen if suffering comes upon Job. And I think Job does improve, meaning that God was right. When God speaks to him, Job says, you know, until now, I've only heard about you. I haven't seen you, now I've seen you. Meaning as a result of the suffering, I take it, he had a heightened religious perception. So in short, I don't think Judaism then accepts the idea that all suffering is punishment for sin. Obviously, much suffering is punishment for sin, one could say, but the notion that all of it is, I think, is not really accepted. One of the most perceptive comments with respect to this problem of evil is something that was raised by Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, uh, who was an outstanding Talmudist. He raises a very simple point. Suppose you believe that a person is suffering because of his sins. What should you do? Should you help him? Seems not. I mean, after all, he, you're going to be interfering with his punishment. Suppose he's suffering because he's atoning for his sins or other people's sins. Well, who are you to step in and stop the process of atonement? And so on for other theodicies. The point is that th the role of a theodicy 
is basically to make peace with evil. On the other hand, your role as a moral agent and as an agent committed to Jewish law, which stresses doing things for people, loving your neighbor, um, extending what's called chesed, loving kindness to them, there's a tension, there's a clash between those two. Because the more beautiful the theodicy, the less reason you have to engage in moral action. Rabbi Soloveitchik presents this tension. And ultimately, his view is, let's put theodicy aside. We're not going to know the answer. It's going to stifle our moral initiative. So let's not think about theodicy. Let's just do. Let's not think of ourselves as sort of uh, victims of some chain of fate that's outside our control. Let's think of ourselves as active agents who are able to act in the moral world. I think this is fascinating because it makes us wonder what exactly do theodicies accomplish. And, um, and they certainly do seem to Maimonides. It seems so some forms of religion eschew explanations of evil, but rather focus on our being good moral agents. But what about all the evil and all the epochs before human beings existed? The suffering and death in evolution itself cannot be caused by human sin. I turn to a Christian minister with a doctorate in physics, the founder for the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences in Berkeley, Robert John Russell. Can science solve the problem of evil? Bob, the big problem is the enormity of suffering, not just in the human world that we mm -hmm. cause, but in, in a, the animal world, in the pre-human evolution. I mean, how do you begin to get your arms around this question? It's absolutely a monumental challenge. One piece I found helpful is the logic behind Augustine's account of, of evil is that it's unnecessary but inevitable. You want to avoid claiming that God creates evil or an evil world, the kind of Manichaean view that evil is and suffering and sin is built into us by nature. It's not necessary that we commit moral evil. On the other hand, you, you can't get yourself out of the mire by your own sort of power of positive thinking. You need God's grace to pull you out of it. For Augustine, the historical fall gave you an account where it's not necessary because the fall is a historical event, but it's inevitable because once it happens, it happens to all of humanity in the world. Can you carry that logic of unnecessary but inevitable beyond the confines of a Garden of Eden account into an evolutionary world? It's similar to saying, to what extent should we say that we sort of inherit um, uh, genetically, biologically, uh, culturally, these tendencies, even though we're still responsible for them. The point to say is that the, the laws of nature, fundamental physical laws of nature, are such that there will be a universe in which life evolves, but it'll evolve at a cost. Can you have an ultimate good result with so much suffering, a, a littered history of such suffering? Right. A lot of folks call it horrendous evil, or evil that seems to go beyond the bounds of well, moral growth or whatever. I would agree completely. You cannot launch any sort of response to evil by saying somehow the end justifies the means. It can't. It doesn't in human relations, it doesn't in nature. What is God's intentions and purpose and all that? It's got to be that every species has some sort of infinite value to God in and of itself. There's an intrinsic value to all of life and not just human life. So my view of our hope, our eschatology, our hope for the transformation of the universe is that all of life all species, maybe even all individuals and species, have some role in that, if you like, heaven, new creation. I despair for humanity. I hope there is a God and that God has reasons for evil. If not, humanity's future is not bright and likely not long. If God did create the world, why evil? Free will, character building, mutual responsibility, connection making. There are many theodicies, systems of arguments that try to explain why God permits evil. But even if evil could be justified, rationalized, would evil have been necessary, required, 
Here's the theology. Evil is not necessary, meaning evil did not absolutely have to happen, but evil is inevitable, meaning that given actual conditions, evil would surely come about. Hmm. That's an awfully fine distinction to absolve God from creating evil. Here's what I think. Notwithstanding all the philosophical flutterings, if God exists, then God created evil. Full stop and no excuses. And there would have to be some kind of afterlife to balance all books. So if this is God's world, a big if, I'd conclude, yes, evil is necessary. Why? To find out, I'll need to get even closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com. <laughs>